I'm going to start off reading here in verses 1 through 4. We'll have a word of prayer and then begin, and I'll explain where we're headed in these final lessons of this series of studies. The second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open up this precious, precious book, that therein we find the words of life, eternal words, your words that are spirit, that impact our inner man. That is where your first place of influence really is. It's in our mind and our heart. We're so thankful for the the power and the significant penetration of the light of your word can be in our dark hearts. And Father, you know that we're up against spiritual wickedness. We're up against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And yet you haven't left us without any equipment. As we've seen already in these series of studies, you have provided to us the whole armor of God. And now, Father, I pray that as we take a back a look at what we've covered in regards to the nature of the war and, and knowing our adversary, know who we're fighting, as well as now the whole armor, we can begin to have these things come to bear upon the things, the spiritual wickedness that we are so bombarded with so that we can stand and withstand to your honor and glory as well as what you've left to us to our glory as well. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Um, we've dealt with the, uh, the whole armor of God recently in Ephesians chapter 6. We've broken down the, kind of the phases of attacks from the adversary, the, the attack of the, the message, the attack of the messenger, the attempts to bring disrepute upon the messenger, and in view of that, we saw the threefold breakdown of the armor of God, the, the mind, the, the issue of our loins girt about with truth, the, the loins of our mind, as it were, the breastplate of righteousness, um, uh, the issue of the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That was one section, the combat, the attack of the, the message. Um, and then when there's the attack of the messenger, uh, we need the, the helmet of salvation, I'm sorry, the, 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 the shield, uh, the shield that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. And when there's that slanderous report that is brought against us to bring disrepute upon the messenger so that others won't receive the message because of that, we have other pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And we've dealt with those things. And I think that this series would be lacking if we didn't really bring that to the to the nitty-gritty, to beginning to look at what are some of the things that we face? What, are, what is some of the darkness that we encounter? It was a part of why I wanted to do a series like this, not only to give you the understanding of our adversary, of knowing the fight and the nature of the fight, and not only to understand the armor of God and how to stand, but really to bring this to bear upon... Uh, the situation, circumstance we find ourselves in. And the reason why I think a series like this is so fitting, as it is all the time, don't get me wrong, but so fitting for our time is because uh, the darkness has gotten darker. And we have faced it a lot, uh, especially in, in, in the last year and a half. Um, we have faced many things that have gone on and a, a bombarding from every side of various things of darkness that get us to, to faint. And sometimes, if you're like me, sometimes not even beginning to realize that you have fainted or not even realizing that you have been in some thoughts in the snare of the devil. 
And I want to bring that to light. And I want you to be able to really think about the things that are being said. There are certain sayings in the world, certain things that we might say, certain things that we have encountered over the last year and a half, and to apply now the doctrine we've learned to that. And, and take these things and, and, and think about them and meditate upon them to really begin to see uh, what's going on. And hopefully, if there is a veil over our eyes of our understanding, that it would be uh, dealt with with the enlightening of our eyes with God's Word. And so that's what I want to cover. That's what I want to go through. Um, and part of that comes from this passage here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you look at verse 3, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness. That's what it's going to be. We're going to encounter some hardness. There's no, for us as Christians in this dispensation of grace, there's, there's no guarantee, there's been no promise by God given to us that things are going to be easy. The only time in which things can be easy is when we compromise, when we don't stand and when we don't withstand. Uh, that's going to be the only time. We see that with the Corinthians. We see that with the Galatians. Uh, Paul says, he says, if I preach circumcision, uh, then he wouldn't be that offense, right? But he doesn't preach circumcision, so he is that offense. And the message that he has is that offense. All you have to do is just change the message, and the, the suffering starts to diminish. And it's interesting, because there's kind of layers to this. People and, and leaders will compromise the message and they'll get less suffering, and then when a little suffering comes on, on, on holding the deity of God or the deity of Christ, they'll even forgo that so they don't have to suffer anymore. For them, it's just a, a game. For them, it's just the issue of, of this life. They don't want to endure any hardness. And then you can just adopt the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Everything's supposed to be smooth. Everything, God's going to bless me a hundredfold. Just got to give my money, and we're good to go. And yet we see here the exact opposite. Paul's telling Timothy, I know Timothy's a pastor, I know he's an overseer of the church, churches there at Ephesus, but this is true of each and every one of us as well. For those that don't receive the grace of God in vain, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that ambassadorship to go out there and share the message and, and proclaim the message and, and live the message, um, that we're going to have to endure hardness. We're going to have to endure hardness. We're in good company as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went through these things. He, in one sense, still suffers them today. And we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. And so we are in the fight, and we are to be good soldiers. And then he gives a little description of that in verse 4. He says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Boy, have not we had in the past year and a half many affairs of this life come up? I mean, a, a, a pandemic? We, had, we went through election season with so much that surrounded the election season and so many things that can get us entangled. And I want you to see as we go through these things how entangled we can be. It's in front of us. We hear it. You just turn on the radio, turn on the TV, look on the internet, go on your news app on your phone, and it's, it's just constantly, constantly there. And it's constantly, we're, we're hearing about it. For us, it's hit really close to home here in Minnesota. Um, for some of you, closer than others to experience some of the things that have been going on. And I want us to be able to see that and what they are and to recognize that if we're going to war, we need to not entangle ourselves in the affairs of this life. What does that mean? That means we must be entangled in the affairs of the life that is to come. If we're not have our loins girt about with truth, our minds saturated with truth, occupied with the word of truth, we by default opt in to be entangled in the affairs of this life. Be not conformed to this world, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're not getting renewed in your mind, you are so susceptible, we are so susceptible to being conformed to this world and being entangled in the affairs of this life. And I want you to see how deep that goes. 
And so he says, we must not entangle ourselves, that, 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 that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We soldier, but on the grounds of truth. We soldier and we war on the grounds of the life that is to come. What does this look like? Well, you even go back to the Lord Jesus Christ. There he is before Pilate. And he says, so you're a king then. And the Lord says, yeah, thou sayest it. I, I am a king. You said it. And, he's, and, and he talks about his kingdom and, and, and all those things. He says, my kingdom is of this world. My servants would fight. But his kingdom is not of this world. So his servants don't fight in the way in which it was being viewed. But oh, is there a fight? Oh, it's a fight. It's, a, a, it's more of a fight than any other fight you could ever be in. And again, I want to show you that as we go on. And we want to please him who hath chosen us, chosen him to be a soldier. We want to please him. And so we need to understand these kind of things. Now, turn, turn over with me in Ephesians chapter 6. I want to draw out something here in Ephesians 6. Again, something that we've looked at and... I want to bring it out just one more time here. If you look at Ephesians 6, verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, what? Stand, right? Then he comes along, and he reiterates that in verse 13. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, what? Withstand in the evil day, and having done all to, what? Stand, and then in verse 14, he says, What? Stand, therefore. So, stand in verse 11, withstand and stand in verse 13, and stand in verse 14. So, four times he essentially declares this issue of the armor is to stand. And we've talked about this a little bit before, so again, part of this is review, but part of it I want to I deal with. And when you look at the issue of standing and, and withstanding, what, what's the alternatives? Well, one of them we've really highlighted. And, and one of them is the issue of the, the opposite of standing and withstanding is that you faint or you fall, right? Yet there's another alternative as well. And this is, this is, a, this is a real dangerous one. And, and it goes hand in hand. It, it, it essentially accomplishes the same thing, but this one actually can take it to a greater level of opposition to God, if I can put it that way. Instead of standing and withstanding, and, and not just fainting or falling, we can actually end up turning and get turned to the point that we actually walk with the adversary. And of course, we know the nature of the fight. The nature of the fight, of the fight, the battleground of the war, is in the mind. It's in our thoughts. You remember that. We don't have to go back there in Second Corinthians, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You have the knowledge and the wisdom of this world against the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And what the affairs of this life like to do is they like to get you entangled, get you over here, and get you away from this. To where you're not only standing and withstanding, you either have fainted or have fallen from the truth of God's word, but you've actually become, from God's perspective, in the snare of the devil, and in all actuality, are walking out his thing. If he can get you entangled in the affairs of this life, not being entangled in the affairs of the life that is to come, you're actively engaged, therefore, in the affairs of this life. He's got you. He's got you. Now, what does that look like? Does that mean, oh, I'm not supposed to go to work? I'm not supposed to do this, that, or the other? No, that's not what, that's not what, it, what we're talking about here. But, but we're, we're talking about in regards to the affairs of this life, if we're not applying truth, if we're not thinking of that truthfully, in view of the light, in view of the truth, and we're thinking on it in, in terms of this life, then we've become entangled. 
I want to just look at a couple passages. And, 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 and by the way, both of these alternatives to standing with, and withstanding come from darkness. And, and again, we, we looked at those words, bewitched, beguiled, subtle. We looked at wiles. The, the, the Greek word of wiles is, I just share this with you because you begin to, you can kind of see what he's getting at. Uh, it's methodia, method. It's the, the, the issue of, uh, of, of trickery. A, a device is a, a, a stratagem. It's, a, it's deceiving. And, and you use a, 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 a strategy, a stratagem, if I'm pronouncing that correct, to gain an advantage of someone. So if, if God wants us to be entangled in the things of the life that is to come now and put that on display, to gain the advantage over us, the adversary, all he needs to do is start to get us entangled in the affairs of this life. To have our affection on things here on earth and not have our affections on things above. And he's so good at it. He's, he's, he's so good. Let's give him credit where he's credit's due. I mean, he's going to be judged for it. Don't get me wrong. But he's so good at it. He's got so much at his disposal. So much. And the mediums he uses, they're so enticing. They're, they're, they, they just grab your attention. And they bewitch and they beguile and they're, they're subtle. Now, just look at a couple passages with me. Come with me to 2 Corinthians 4. This is the one we have looked at for uh, throughout this series. He uses this term twice here in 2 Corinthians 4. Look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we, what? Faint. faint not. We faint not. And that's what the adversary wants to do. He wants us to, to faint, to not stand. And so one of the things that God gives is, is to understand the, the grandeur and the mercy of the ministry that's given him and the ministry that's given each and every one of us. To see how powerful it really is. To see its eternal life that it's able to give. And the wisdom that is there, that is unworldly, and that is fit for another realm, another time, a time to come. And in view of that, Paul says, if we have received this mercy, we faint not. I can't faint. I can't faint having this. And then he further develops that in verse 15, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Even in the midst of suffering, he's going to take that armor of God, and in his mind he's going to be girt, and he's going to be solidified, and in his inner man he's going to stand against the wiles of the devil to try to get him entangled in the affairs of this life. He's going to stand and withstand against it. But look at this other one, this issue of, of going along with the adversary. What a, what a snare that would be. What a trick that would be. To, to think you're walking, think you're doing something, and yet you're actually going against what God wants you to do. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, when he's dealing with Timothy here, and again, we were just in chapter 2 here, he describes what Timothy needs to be because of this particular situation. Look what he says in verse 24 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that, what? Oppose themselves. When you oppose yourself, it's when you oppose truth, when truth is for you, truth is the way. It, 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 it's, it's God's life. It's the light. When you oppose truth, when you oppose God's word, you're really opposing yourself. That's why Timothy needs to be apt to teach, because 
he's going to be dealing with people that oppose the truth. Sure, they say things, and they might even say it's truth, but they're rejecting the truth, and they need to be, a servant of the Lord must be apt to teach because you've got people that are opposing themselves. But look at the further predicament that they're in and why, they would, why Timothy needs to do this. If God peradventure will give them repentance, that's a, a change of mind to the acknowledging of the what? There it is. So they're not acknowledging the truth. They're opposing themselves. Timothy be apt to teach so because it's going to be through that teaching. God will grant give provision for, they still got to receive it, give provision for a change of their mind. It's what we want. When someone's going their way and they're opposing themselves, we don't necessarily know if they've been given the truth, if they've been given the alternative. So what do we want to give? We want to show them. We want to show them, hey, this is where it's at. This is the truth. Look at this. And so you dress that up with gentleness and meekness and instructing and being apt to teach, being ready, instructing them. In meekness doing that. That's going to be the way. The, the blending of truth with what, what becomes truth, the, the adornment, the manner of life, the gentleness, the not striving, the patience, the meekness. Oh, That's a man, a servant of the Lord. That's a, that's a man and a, and a woman who can bear and forbear and suffer long those that oppose themselves, not for their own profit, but for the profit of others. But now look at verse 26. He says, this will all take place, he says, and that they may recover themselves. That's such a wonderful verse. Because oftentimes we think we have to recover someone. We don't recover someone, we just give them the truth so that they can recover themselves. And he says that they may uh, recover themselves, look at, out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What a strategy. What, what, that, that word snare, it, it's, it's the same thing. It's a trick. It's a stratagem. It's a means to gain the advantage for you not to progress. But it's not like they're not doing anything. They're opposing themselves. They're actively engaged in what they're going after. And part of that is in view of what he said earlier on in the chapter, not being entangled in the affairs of this life. And that is what we want to consider. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse 1. Many of these things can have a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. And, and look at what he does. Look at what the adversary provides for people to, to go after. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So what do they do? Here they got the body of teaching that they need to have, the truth, and they depart from it. Now this is going to be on a much grand, this is a grand scale. We see this under the umbrella of Christianity today. My focus primarily is the issue of us taking heed. Us being cautious. Us identifying, are we in the snare of the devil? Are we entangled in the affairs of this life? Are we saying we stand and withstand, but we're really not? Are we, have we actually fainted in some sort, or have we actually taken that step further where we're actually taking strides against what God's doing. Where we would look and say, wow, he's so subtle. And some don't even have their senses exercised to be able to discern this good and evil. And so he says, some shall depart from the faith. He says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? devils. There's that darkness, the propagation of, of darkness. It's doctrine. It's teaching. To get it in your mind, to get it in your heart, and to, to take it up. And, and, and sometimes it, 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 listen, what we're going to go through, I'm going I'm to go through some of these and, and some of the sayings that are out there. They just sound so good. And, and, and there's other things in the background of it that, that so many and so many Christians just take it in. And they don't recognize it. They don't, they don't see it. It's he's so subtle that we end up becoming beguiled. 
They speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then he lists the particular things that were going on at that time. My point to you in going to this verse is that there's many more doctrines of devils than just the ones given in chapter 4. Okay? Now, I want to start to examine some of these wiles that we need to stand against. Again, these wiles are, are just the issue of that, that method, the, the trickery. We know how they're going to come. They're going to come in, in darkness. That means it's error. It's not truth. And what I suggest to you in, in taking and adding 2 Timothy chapter 2 there and, and the issue of not being entangled in the affairs of this life is we need to be able to understand that part of the darkness that is subtle in entering in has a particular focus in regards to the things of this life. So I start getting, getting you to things, thinking on things of this life. Now again, that doesn't mean that you turn around and you're not thinking about your spouse or you're not thinking about your children. It, it, it doesn't mean that, but I want you to see in view of the last year and a half, things that we've gone through and things that you've probably heard and maybe even things that you stand for, maybe we should re-examine some of those things. Because maybe some of those things are darkness. Maybe some of those things are the wiles of the devil. So, I have four that I kind of want to go through. And I want to take in view of everything that we've looked at, and I want to take the whole armor of God, and I want these things to converge upon these four kind of sayings, these four things that we've begun to be encounter. And I want to, I want to try to deal with them at, at numerous angles to test them and prove them and see, is that a godly thought? Is that truth? Or is it not? And we have some measures to bring upon these things to help us to be able to see them and not faint at them, and not knowing that we, we fainted, and not actually walking in line with these things. So here's a couple for you. Now, I'm, again, I'm, I'm intending to get down. Nitty gritty sounds too superficial. <laughs> but get down to real issues, things that we've encountered. So here's, here's one. You've probably heard something like this. And I want to deal with this and this a little bit more. The pandemic, the coronavirus, is God's judgment upon the world. But there's also another one out there. The coronavirus is not God's judgment upon the world. The coronavirus, you probably maybe have heard this, it was a plandemic. A plandemic. That's one of them. The second one, the vote, right? We just came out of an election. The vote, the ballot box, this is how we fight. This is how we win. You may have heard that kind of terminology in the world. And Christians embracing it. Here's another one that kind of goes with that, but I'm going to treat it as separate. Republicans, they are Christians. How could any Christian be a Democrat? Democrats are not Christians. And the fourth one, the riots that are going on are being done for a, a worthy cause. Join the fight. Join the fight. So let's deal with the first one. The pandemic is God's judgment upon the world. Now, I hear a statement like that, which oftentimes comes from churchianity, and it's just poor theology, poor understanding of the dispensation of the grace of God. But what has been difficult for me to hear is that when other Christians go to, to deal with the issue of God, it's God's judgment upon the world, they don't go to sound doctrine. Many Christians come along and they refer to the intentional modification, dispersion of the virus. It was all planned out. Now think about that. It's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to really think about these things. Well, if that's an unbeliever, 
is that really the, what you want them to understand and get? That was all planned out. It was all, it was all planned out. Oh yeah, let me tell you about Christ. Good luck. Now if we really think about it, where does most of the world get their information? They get it from the mainstream media, they get it from the news. And so you're, you're combating the thought of, of the darkness that the pandemic is God's judgment upon the world and you're dealing with it in view of what I'm calling temporal light. Let's say that is true. Let's go down that road. Go down the course and say undoubtedly there is proof that this virus was modified and this virus was dispersed into the world's population and all the other things that go along. Go down that road. And then begin to think, what good is it if the truth of that comes out and the people that you want to go to jail, go to jail, and the world knows the truth. But do they know the truth? Do they know the truth? The way and the life. This has happened all the time when these big things happen. World War II comes on the scene. If only the war will stop. If people will lay down their weapons, we will have peace. But will they really have peace? Will they really have life? No. That's how subtle he is. He'll give you temporal light. He'll he'll get Christians caught up in temporal light. Take it down its course. Say it's true. But what is that really? Of what substance is that? To the world. People will talk about that stuff as if, it, as if it's gospel. It's truth. And the truth needs to come out. And you'll start to hear all this talk about we're in a battle, we're in a fight between good and evil. Well, when, when have we not been in a fight between good and evil? And what's the good that is oftentimes being dealt with when they talk about the pandemic? It's the good of the truth in this life. It's temporal. And so what do we give them when they come along and they say the pandemic is God's judgment upon the world? Or even a Christian who, or a non-Christian who comes, man, we must be doing something wrong because God's judging us. And you come along and say, no, that's a pandemic. You've just wasted, you've completely wasted an opportunity for not only the truth of the gospel, but the truth of the dispensation of the grace of God. And we actually think that stuff is going to impact that individual spiritually when it will have no profit whatsoever. What good is it if a man understands it was a pandemic, but he loses his own soul? He loses his soul. I talked to brothers, and they said they don't really address these things, and I tried to hold off. But the adversary's got us. If we're taking that line of thinking and we're holding that up as something significant, you're not standing. You're not withstanding. You haven't even fallen. You're walking with him. Because he's got you wrapped up in some good. But look at that good. What good is it? It's not God's good. It's temporary good. Come with me to Matthew chapter 15. I just quoted that. This is such a profound passage. We need to recover ourselves if we be so in this snare. To understand in view of these things. And listen, it's coming. These things, these things are not a deterrent to the gospel they can so be an accelerant to the gospel. People are looking. People are hungry. People want to have answers. People are wondering what in the world is going on. Look at the chaos. Look at the rioting. Look at the pandemic. Look at the infighting that's going on. Look at the backbiting. Man, it, the world's in chaos right now. Where's the answers? Who has the answer? The person who has temporary good answers 
or who has the word of life and is holding it forth. That's the one we want to be. Wholesale. Wholesale. In Matthew chapter 15, come down to verse 24. That is not the passage I wanted to be in. <laughs> I must have wrote it wrong. Let me, let me check one thing real quick here. Well, the passage was the, I should know it off the top of my heart. Here it is. It's chapter 16. I just can't read my own handwriting. I probably... Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 24. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what, man, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then the, he shall reward every man according to his works. And he goes on and talks about that. We are not to measure the success of truth based upon its temporary earthly victories, but upon eternal opportunities. That's how we're to measure the success of truth. It is truth in and of itself, but it ought to ring with the sound of eternity. Come with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. The Lord taught this during his earthly ministry, this concept, which is phenomenal because they were living during a time when God was imputing the trespasses against them, although part of that was on halt because of this acceptable year of the Lord, uh, because of the light that had come. But you look at Luke chapter 13, look at verse 1. There were present at, the se uh, at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said to them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Christ didn't come here and he didn't say, well, that tower the Romans actually devised to fall and the people died and they deserve to die too. We don't know if that's true, of course, or not. We just know that the tower fell. But he doesn't look for an opportunity to explain the truthfulness of, well, the structure wasn't built very good. and He comes along and what does he use it for? He uses it for eternal opportunity because they died. It wasn't the structure of the building. It wasn't any kind of truth surrounding that. It was that they died. And the issue is, don't concern yourself with all that. People are dying. And whether you think they're dying because of the coronavirus or not, people are dying, just like they were before the coronavirus. And so what changes? Nothing. We share the gospel. We come together. We're edified. We go out there and we live Christ. Even if the Lord could expose there was a Roman conspiracy going on here, what gain would that really have? It would have none. Instead, we see him use it for an eternal opportunity. A saying like this, that this pandemic is God's judgment on the world, gives us such an opportunity to teach people, believers and unbelievers, to teach them about God and about God's things. Teach them, 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21, that God was in Christ, not imputing their trespasses against them but reconciling the world unto himself. Romans chapter 11, he reconciled the world. Sure, the wrath is coming, but not yet. And if you were to die from the virus, 
Where would you spend eternity? Hopefully we see the difference between entangling ourselves in the affairs of this life and entangling ourselves in the affairs of the life that is to come when it comes to this kind of issue. It's not that we're ignorant of whatever it is, but how are we using it? It would be foolish for us to receive the grace of our ambassadorship in vain by trying to prove a temporal truth that, by the way, when we see in Romans chapter 2, God's going to judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. He'll judge all secrets. It's not for us necessarily to judge those things, but we have a judgment to make that if he died for all, then all were dead. All are dead. The day that live, those that believe, should live unto him who died for them. That's the judgment we should make. We don't know, we're not supposed to know things after the flesh. We're supposed to know them after the spirit. That is what makes us different. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. So we begin to see his subtlety. A wasted opportunity. We'll spend our time and our effort trying to figure out the secrets of men and conspiracies. Some say, there's not conspiracies or not yet, or that that they are or not. (laughs) That's not the point. The the point isn't trying to figure out if this really happened or not. The issue is, how much time? Listen, I know, I, I, I went through it. The issue is, how much time are you spending in that? When you can be spending on sharing the gospel with other people. And when we really think about it truly, we're just thinking about it temporarily. Because the judgment and the revelation of all of it is going to come out. They'll be held accountable if that be true. Our concern is not the affairs of this life, but the affairs of the life that is to come. Are not our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? We are to be prepared to give them the gospel and the gospel of peace, the dispensation, the grace of God, and that they could have peace with God, and they could experience the peace of God, and they can live peaceably with all men, and they can live a quiet and peaceable life in all, honest, in, 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 in all godliness and honesty. So we see his subtlety. It's not just the evil. It's the worldly good. It's the temporary good. A measure of truthfulness that adorns itself as what our loins should be shod with. That's truth. I'm going after truth. We'll take that truth down the corridor to its end if it were to be revealed and what kind of good comes from it. If it's temporary good, be mindful of how much time we spend in it. Now, I just have a little more time to introduce the second one. The vote is how we fight. All we win is in the ballot box. I hope in light of this series you've seen how foolish that kind of thinking is. I mean, how? Silly. And that was wisdom until there was the possibility of election fraud. Now you can't win at the ballot box if you're applying that wisdom. Now what kind of wisdom do you got? Temporary. What, you're going to fight? You're going to follow the same fraud tactics? Well, we've got to vote. We've got to get the right people in there. The right people? We've got to get the good guys in there. Good guys? Think about what we're saying. First of all, what are we fighting why I wanted to go through, where's the fight? The fight's not in the ballot box. The fight is the heart of the one who votes. It's the heart. Not the ballot. Not the vote. And what means are we going to use to fight? There's such a fine line when you get to this issue of fighting where you actually become the very thing that you're fighting against. That's what the world is. That the world wants to fight and they see, oh, but this, is, but this is righteous. And as soon as they think they have that righteous cause, they're so close to actually fighting and participating in sin 
to get their objectives accomplished. And what objectives? Temporary worldly objectives. Oh, our fight is so unique. It's so peculiar. Because it never, the true man of God, the true woman of God, I'm not saying a believer or not, or, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about a mature believer understands the nature of the fight. They don't need to kill someone to get their objectives accomplished. They see laying down their lives, they see suffering because God's word tells that, they see that as winning the fight. That's our Savior. He laid down his life. And it looks like he's losing and he's winning. He's absolutely winning. Victorious. I mean, put to chagrin his adversaries. Make an open show to his adversaries kind of winning. But of course, you have to have faith to believe that. A shield of faith. Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked that get you to think you're not winning. Come on, don't pick up that sword. Pick up this one. Get those objectives accomplished. Get those goals. Get those earthly temporal gain. Same thing he tempted the Lord with. Get the glory. I'll give you the glory. Just bow down and worship me. And that's how easy it is. When you look at the glory and you don't look at the means to that end and you compromise the means to the end, you just want the end. Give me the end. God doesn't want just the end. He wants the means to the end. And he'll be faithful to judge us in that manner, in that way, as believers. So what's the fight? Well, here they're using the weapon of the vote. It's not the weapon God gave us. He gave us the sword of the Spirit to deal with the thoughts and the intents of the heart. To get to the root of all that. Come with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and we'll start to wind this down. We'll deal with some more in time to come and lessons to come. Titus chapter 3, look at verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto how many men? All men. You believe that verse. then you don't look for a certain party to be gentle and meek. A certain party to be in authority. Listen, now I know many people don't like to hear this. And so I'll say it gently. In the light of eternity, it does not matter. That verse can be applied no matter who's in authority, who's in office. The only bearing that a party might have is in regards to the affairs of this life. And based upon their posture towards godly things, determine how much you'll suffer for what you believe or not. That's essentially the bearing that, that those things have on you. We are free. We are free. What was the greatest deliverance? When God freed us from sin. When He freed us from the law. We have a liberty in Christ that no party, no government, no government can take away from us. So many times we say things in view of our Christianity and in view of who's in authority. And we begin to realize how much bondage that Christian really is in. They think their Christianity, the success of it, is based upon who's in authority. 
Good night. What about the other our brothers and sisters in other countries? That's just an experiential proof. We have a more sure word in the Word of God that it doesn't matter. It ultimately does not matter. What's going to happen is this is, again, it's going to determine how much we suffer or not. Now, I don't want to suffer. I'm not saying don't go vote. But be mindful, are you entangled in the affairs of this life? Look at the rest of the verse. Look how humbling this is in view of why we should be subject, why we should obey, be ready to every good work, speak evil of no man, no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Why? Why would we do this? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the wrath of God, is that what it says? The wrath and love of God our Savior toward man appeared? No, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Anytime we begin to speak evil of someone and do the opposite of what these verses are, you're forgetting who you are by nature. You're forgetting where you came from. You're forgetting the kindness and love of God towards you, or you just don't think that of yourself by nature. You don't think that of yourself. You think, well, I wasn't like that, so I can do it to this. I'm justified in doing it. I wasn't like that, so I can say these things to them. The reality is, as he says, we were sometimes foolish, disobedient, and did all these things. But how did God respond to us? the same way we're supposed to uh, respond to others whom we used to be. Hopefully, we used to be. In practicality. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Why are we expecting works of righteousness from the ungodly who cannot do any righteousness? I mean, they're alive to sin. We're expecting righteousness to come from someone who's alive to sin and dead to God. Just completely taking our sound doctrine, throwing it out of the window, looking at it go by, and completely turning our direction this way, and we've already not, are not standing, and we're not withstanding. And, and when we adopt the whole mentality of righteousness from an unrighteous, we actually start going against what we've believed. We've thrown it out. So where are we? Are we standing or withstanding? Are we holding that even in view of this in a situation? Yeah, I don't prefer, I don't like. But we're so, we're so standing, we're so strong because of our doctrine. We don't let it go. We allow it to be that armor so that now instead when my enemy, instead of speaking evil about him, brawling against him, this, that, murmuring and complaining, getting at them. I've got to get that truth. That truth's got to be told. It was fraud in that election. Oh, yeah. But do you know who Christ is? You've just esteemed a temporal truth, if it be a truth, and compromise the eternal one. He's so subtle. He's so beguiling. What we need to do is fight a fight of grace. And that's hard. That means you're kind and meek towards someone that does not deserve it. That's hard. That's grace. A kindness when not deserved. We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness and not become what we're fighting against but manifest a light so that others would be attracted to it. That's what we need to be. Are people being attracted to your life, seeing something different? And what I love about this church is that although there are things that we need to, obviously, as we all do, need to work on things, 
that light is here. It does shine. And I can give you stories upon stories of that. And I encourage us, in view of some of these things, in view of the last year and a half, we would examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. That we're holding the faith. And we're letting it be our armor and we're standing and withstanding against the wiles of the devil. That we utilize these things not as opportunity to uphold and stand for and, and, and protest and argue some temporal truth and waste it for in eternal opportunity. And so be taken in and tricked and deceived to think that we're going after some worthy cause when we're really just entangling ourselves in the affairs of this life. But that we would see our true cause, the cause of Christ, that that would constrain us and that we would in turn stand. We would in turn share the gospel. That we would be ready. And that we would not just take in these things and be so wrapped up in this life Get wrapped up in the life that is to come. You will not regret it. There's so much joy there. There's so much freedom there. Even when it seems like all your freedoms are being stripped in this life, you're starting to recognize how free you really are because no one can take away your life that is hidden Christ with God. No one can. And as much as I have a tongue and much as I can speak, that we'll go down sharing the gospel even to those that are taking away these temporary things. May we see the value of eternal things with the eyes of our understanding and be entangled therein. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look at some of these things. There's other ones that we look at and we will look at. But I hope we can boil it down as we use the authority of your word, as we use the insight and understanding of your word, what we ought to get wrapped up in. And that is you. That is your truth. Pressing is not easy, but that's exactly what we're to do. We're to press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Press toward that mark for the prize. That prize is you. You are worthy of our time. You are worthy of our admiration. You are worthy of our curiosity and our intrigue. It belongs to no one else. May we not give it to anyone else. Your world to come will abide forever. These truths or falsehoods, we must recognize them that are in the world as temporary. It is child's play for the adversary. It is his tactics, his devices that get us so wrapped up in. Father, I pray through something like this that we would awake to righteousness. We would awake to the life that is to come. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let's cast off those works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's put on Christ. And let's learn more of your word. Let's preach your word and live your word until we see you and we abide forever no longer having these things bombard us and vex us, beguile us and bewitch us, but bask in your glory for all eternity. We give you all the thanks and praise for the power and the searching of your word in all things, that we might think the way you think and live the way you live and stand and withstand the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. We belong to one that is higher than they all. That is to you, Father. And you have given us spiritual blessings that are able to stand and withstand that spiritual wickedness. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.